Good afternoon and welcome to the House Environment and Energy Committee. We are going to talk about, take up S213, the flood safety bill from Senate. And we're first gonna hear from Green Mountain Power. Thank you, good afternoon. Uh, for the record, I'm Josh Castlegay with Green Mountain Power, the President, uh, Chief Innovation Officer there. So one of the areas that I oversee is our generation fleet, which includes our hydro, all of our dams, um, I just plan to quickly talk about what we what we operate for for dams uh, here in Vermont, um, the kind of the dam safety aspect of the bill, and yeah, and then take any questions. Um, so GMP currently has just uh, 51 dams, between most of those being in Vermont, a few of those in New Hampshire. 43 of those dams are regulated by the FERC, so don't really pertain to the bill in question here, but uh, the FERC regulates, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission regulates how the dam safety inspection process works, um, the plans and procedures and public safety stuff that we do around those, those facilities. And then we have eight, um, eight dams located in a few different parts of Vermont that are under currently under the Public Utility Commission for us. So those are dams like uh, Marshfield Dam, Chittenden Dam down outside of Rutland, Chittenden, um, and a few other smaller dams. Those in the, I, I believe you have the list there, and they're a mix of hazard classifications. So currently those are, those dams, those eight are regulated by the Public Utility Commission. If we go to, we, we do our safety work, our safety inspections on those dams, so we, we follow the PUC rules for those, but we basically do them the same way um, to the strict standard that we do with our FERC facilities. Um, the classification, I don't know if, I, I think Mr. Green was in here, probably talked about the different classifications of dams. There's, there's low, low hazard, which are, you'd expect if something were to happen to the dam, it's a low impact, um, significant and high hazard, which is just how they classify the impact if something were to happen from one of these facilities. Those classifications dictate what you need to do for inspections, what you need for emergency action plans, um, and that's all defined. It's defined by the FERC for the FERC dams. PUC has a rule for the PUC, Public Utilities Commission dams that we uh, manage, and then the DEC also has a set of rules for their dam safety. The We put together a simple little chart, and you've probably seen something similar around the different regulatory bodies and what the inspection routines are for the different dams, um, you know, with the top being the FERC, which again is most of our dams, and we follow the FERC inspection progress, uh, process, which is a mix of, of inspections on annual bases, five-year, 10-year, depending on the level of detail. And we, um, we operated with a team of folks who are at our dams on a daily, every other day basis as well, inspecting those. And the PUC, Public Utility Commission rule, has a similar set of inspection guidelines, standards. The only other thing I wanted to hit was just to talk a little bit about, um, not only, obviously the dams that GMP operates are generating electricity. Um, a lot of these dams have been running for, for quite some time producing hydropower for us, but they are leveraged um, they do provide a benefit during flooding conditions, which I think sometimes can get lost in this. So, you know, when we're operating our facilities, first and foremost is the safety of the, of the dam, of the infrastructure around it, the public and our team. And then once that is established and uh, we can leverage the dam for flood control, for example. So this past July, um, obviously everyone's aware of the significant flooding event, precip event that we had here. So some of the things we do leading up to those is, is a lot of just forecasting, just like we do for storms, um, what we're expecting for precipitation, and that then informs us what we do to manage water in the facility behind the dam. We can make more room, for example, um, as we know there's going to be more precip coming. And this summer, as an example, so Marshfield is essentially the start for the most part of the Winooski River. Um, feeds into the very top near the headwaters of the Winooski River. During the peak of the, the flooding event, we were able to leverage Marshfield to hold back essentially half of what was 
coming in. So imagine, you know, in this case, it was 2,400 CFS, which stands for cubic feet per second, just how much water is flowing into the facility. And at the peak, we let out 1,000. So there's 2,400 coming in, 1,000 going out. That meant half of that, or about 1,400, was staying behind in the dam. If you picture the dam is not there, then the full 2,400 CFS is just adding to the conditions in the river downstream. So it's just an example of just, you know, to make sure folks are aware that they, there is a, uh, a benefit for some of the facilities when it comes to managing. Again, our first operation is to make sure the dam is safe and the operations are safe. And then second, if we're able to leverage it to manage flows like that, uh, we continue to do that. Um, I think those were kind of the highlights I plan to hit, so we to take questions. Sure, thanks for your testimony. Um, so is it, are you, do you support the bill? Yeah, so on the, uh, the I think the, the piece that we're focused on is the change of regulation from PUC to DC. Essentially, we, we, we don't have an issue. We've been agnostic to that. Which regulatory body ultimately oversees it? Um, we're gonna continue to operate high level of safety that we do today. So we don't have a concern with that change. Yeah, thanks for your testimony, Josh. The uh, scenario you were just talking about with the flooding. So who who's coordinating that? Is that emergency management that's coordinating um, the releases with you all? When it comes to our own facilities, it's, it's us. Um, so it's GMP managing our facilities. Different than like say the Townsend Dam or the Ball or, or Wrightsville that the state um, operations may decide on. When it comes to running our dams, we're, we're coordinating. We're in communication with the state and, you know, throughout these, these events, but we're determining the best way to manage the operation of the dam during these events. Okay. And this shift from um, PUC to DEC would not change your operation during flooding? Yeah, as far as I understand, I mean, you know, one of the things that we're going to be, regardless of who regulates it, um, maintaining certain aspects of the dam in terms of being able to make room in the facility when there's floods coming, you know, that we're going to want to make sure we maintain. Um, that's a really important aspect of the safety of the dam. So if, if there were other, uh, you know, factors trying to change that, we would be really digging into that quite a bit. But um, so we would see is continuing to operate the dam safely. That's a, that's a key piece for us. Um, yeah. Your question? Yeah. Um, of the eight dams that you have that are overseen by the PUC, what, what, are, what are the categories of those eight? Um, yeah. Couple, I actually put a list. So most, so we've got two, uh, one, two, three are high hazard, one is significant hazard, um, the remainder are low hazard. So three high, which again, East Pittsford, which is our Chittenden facility, Marshfield, um, and our Middlesex Dam. And those three plus the one. What are the conditions of those dams on that on the condition chart? Like the the condition of I forget what the terminology is for. Oh, how Mr. Green might have talked about them? Yeah, excellent, essentially. So because our our dams may be a little bit different, um, well, they're all in excellent condition. So basically we're on we're monitoring them and, and doing work on them every single day and all year. Um and you know, following again, we we the PUC uh, rules are sort of like the minimum that we do. We usually look at the FERC guidance and and look to meet that across the dams anyway. Um, but and there's a continuous improvements happening at these facilities too. As there's more automation, as there's more, you know, Marshfield, for example, over the years, things like camera installation to be able to visually see from our control room twenty four seven and. Um, automated gates and a number of different things. So there's constant improvements as well. Is it fair to say the FERC regulations are more stringent than the PUC? They're, yeah, I think they're, they're, so FERC and PUC are fairly similar. I would say those two are more stringent currently than DEC. So there's a, there's a DEC dam safety rule, which I'm not as familiar with, but I, we, we highlighted just the inspection periods. The PUC dam safety rule is the one that we um, we follow, and that's a little bit more stringent on its ins on its full inspection 
periodical. I'm assuming there would be a rulemaking update process as part of this. I know that's in there. Um, and the only thing we would say too, in terms of that transition, I know, I believe the DC, DC has asked about just the timing of that. I mean, we would support making sure there's enough time for that transition to happen. So they were able to either get the resources, do what they needed to do to make sure there was, there's no gap for us. We're going to continue to maintain the dam sort of regardless of which entity is, is overseeing it at similar to the FERC level, but um, yeah. For all your dams, like if you were having like a flood event or you can manage the sort of amount you're generating with the grid need and like just not generate, even if you're still managing for a flood or even trying to release water. Yeah. So you look at, you know, when, when you have high precip event, a lot of different things go on at the ponding facilities, which is like a marsh field. Um, you'll use the generator, the penstock, to move water out of the dams. You can move water out of that dam a couple of ways, through the penstock, through the generator, through what's called the spillway, which has a gate. And those, those are essentially the, the ways. So you would control all of those things together, get the water level to where we determined it was the right point based on forecast for the precip coming in. Um, and you manage all of those things, all of those things together at the same time. And you can do that. Through the through an event um, by controlling gates, generation, and a number of different things there. Um, and would you consider any of your hydro facilities base load? Yeah, yeah. I mean, so the you know we think of it in capacity factor. Basically, how much is it across the full year? And hydro runs from fifty to seventy percent is is one way to think of it. So it's it's pretty base load. What some there's two types of hydro. Uh, stations run a river called and then ponding run a river is exactly as it sounds river is flowing in and out and it's just whatever's coming in is flowing out through the generator or over the dam um, ponding is where you can actually manage you can peak it's called so like during high priced times we can let a little more through the generator um, but for the most part I mean, as long as there's water that it's generating it may not be at full output on a dry july day but you're still generating something and then as there's more water, you're generating more. But they are, there's always some hydro running pretty much all the time. At all of them? What's, I'm sorry? At all of your dams? Yeah, yeah. I mean, some of the, as things dry up in August, you might not have enough water for certain facilities. So they'll change throughout the year. Um, but we, you know, we have a, about, it's changed a little bit, but around 100 megawatts of hydro combined. So, you know, you might be generating anywhere from 30 to 100 throughout the year, depending on how much water there is and what else is going on on the system. You know how many are ponded versus spillway? I'd have to, I'd have to follow up with you on that. I do have that. All right. Any further questions? Thanks for your testimony. Thank you. Next up, we have Jessica Luisos. Hi. I'm just launching. Welcome. Yes. Introduce <laughs> yourself for the record. Sure. Um, I am Jessica Luisos, and I am I'm just going to make sure I'm connected here before I forget. Um, I have some information I'm going to show up on the screen here. You don't need to see yourselves. Um, okay. So I am here with two different hats. Um, my first hat is as a licensed professional engineer here in the state. Um, I am a civil engineer. My title is a water resource engineer, which is sometimes called a river engineer. So um, most of my work is around rivers. I work on dams. Um, I specialize in projects that have a geomorphology, um, river science component. Um, a lot of that work that's not on dams is with river restoration, floodplain restoration. I, do, I work with a lot of communities on flood recovery and flood mitigation projects. So um, today I am here to focus on the dam part of, of my job, but um, there's other components of the bill that you're looking at that fall kind of within uh, my work as well. So if you had questions on river corridors, I could also 
um, maybe chime in about that as well. Um, my second hat that I'm here with today is um, through the American Society of Civil Engineers. Um, our group, um, professional engineering group, has put together a report. Um, you know, we have a published copy. The full report um, has been uploaded to your website. Um, and I put together some summary slides to kind of walk through the pieces that are most important to um, the bill you're looking at here on DMs. Um, so this report was put together by um, 20 volunteer civil engineers from around the state, um, with the idea being that um, as the people who design, maintain, inspect different types of infrastructure, um, our society nationally has decided that it's important to then give back some of that information for people to be able to use for decision making. So um, our report has looked at multiple different types of infrastructure. Um, DAMS is just one of them. And we look at a whole variety of criteria, um, condition, capacity, funding, a lot of different things that go into our analysis. And then along with that, we then give a, a letter grade similar to a report card um, to each type of infrastructure. So Vermont's DAMS, um, just last year in um, 23, received a C, um, which is mediocre. Um, essentially means that we, we need to be investing in our dams and our dam infrastructure to make sure that we're keeping up to speed um, and maintaining them in a safe, uh, a safe situation. Can we talk a little bit about that? There, yeah, we've we're starting to understand the broad spectrum of different types of dams. How do you how do you account for that if you're averaging them all together? I mean, you know, a fish and wildlife dam with a C versus a yeah. hazard. So it's a really good point. So it's it's an average of how we're doing across all of these different categories. Um, do we have rules in place that are um, having inspection schedules that are appropriate for the different types of hazard classes? Um, is there enough staff available to um, do those inspections and, and report and follow up on, on dams that have issues. So it's not only about the condition, um, you know, cause you're right. We just heard from a, a very proactive dam owner who is maintaining their particular dams in excellent condition, but that is not the case across, you know, all of the dams in the state. So, so there is an average um, part of it is um, comparison to other states and where other states are at with, with um, staffing level condition, um, have there been a lot of failures? So it is, it is kind of compared to how other states and, and nationally um, can we fit into that national piece. So who's an A? Hmm? Who's an A? There are currently no states at an A in dams. So you guys are tough graders, is what I'm yeah. <laughs> We are tough graders. Um, when we first did our report card um, in 2012, dams did have a lower grade. So we have made some progress through the 2018 um, bill, which gave some additional authority to the dam safety program. Um, and there have been some temporary staff added um, that have kind of helped with their capacity um, kind of in that time period. So we have made some steps towards improvement, uh, but are still- at So I guess, but how much of our C is a risk to the public versus, hello, legislators, we need to fund the program better? Yeah, so I do have some more specifics on that with some really specific recommendations on um, what we can do. I understand that this is like a big, a big C. C. It doesn't make a lot of sense with what you can actually do to improve that. So some of the things that you'll see kind of at the beginning of our report are some overarching um, goals for infrastructure. And, and some of these um, really pertain more to your bill at, at the higher level of making sure that we're looking at resilience, making sure we have the workforce in place that we need to um, really have um, safe functioning infrastructure. So this is just in there as an idea of, you know, you're on the right track. Um, when we start to look at dams specifically, um, the chart here is looking at the use of the dams. Um, 
And a lot of the uses of the dams are not known or don't have a specific use that they're being used for um, currently. So, you know, you heard from um, some a landowner that has uh, hydroelectric dams. That's just one piece of the bigger puzzle of what these dams are used for. Um, and as you've heard from dam safety, there's over a thousand in the state, um, very few new dams. Um, but what we have seen is there have been some removal of dams. Um, we've seen 19 in the last four years. Um, when dams don't have an active purpose, like that over 500 um, in the blue uh, kind of row on the chart there, they are much more likely to deteriorate and become safety problems. Um, some landowners just don't have a reason to maintain their dams, they are, and they are not doing that. So removal is one way to um, kind of just remove the safety issue from the river system in the case where uh, they aren't otherwise being used. We so you heard a little bit yeah, about just a the, quick question yeah, yeah. from that slide yeah. of the dams in the blue are that are that are not active or um, are they mostly low risk or some of them in the other two categories? Yeah, it's a mix, um, and some of them just don't have an active use but still are a higher hazard or significant hazard. So, so the use is not tied specifically to the hazard. So that hazard class is mixed yeah, so kind I, of throughout the back. Race. What are you, you said that the ones that are not active are more likely to not be well-maintained. My question then was, are most of those not being well-maintained low risk or are some of them also? It is definitely a mix. Okay. So some of those are ones that have infrastructure down and homes downstream that could be damaged. Um, so then looking a little closer at that hazard potential, you can see it's, it's a real mix of hazard potentials throughout the inventory, um, 67 of which are in that high hazard category. So if they fail, the loss of life is probable. That's part of the definition um, as well as the other damages to the environment and property. Um, one of the things we've seen here is that um, the that analysis of figuring out which hazard category a dam should be in has not been updated kind of throughout the dam's lifespan. So um, it's likely that some of the dams in the low or unclassified or unknown categories may be high. Um, and it is one of the things that the new rules, um, kind of the phase two of the rules um, that dam safety has been kind of working towards would, would start to address by having um, kind of a reevaluation of that hazard classification, not just when the dam is built. You know, in a lot of cases, this was over a hundred years ago for some of these and maybe hasn't been reevaluated in that time period. So, you know, you can kind of, give the hazard potential a little bit of grain of salt because it's not a constantly reevaluated. Um, ownership. Um, so I think one of my big points here is that a lot, um, contrary to a lot of our infrastructure, like roads or bridges, the people who own those roads and bridges are experts in that type of infrastructure and have a whole, um, kind of system for taking care of it. Um, most dam owners are not dam experts. They, they bought property that has a dam on it. They are a town um, that has inherited a dam over time um, and they are not um, experts. And, um, you know, I think in that way, it means that as a state, there's a little bit more responsibility to be kind of making sure that someone's following up on safety issues um, and enforcing the rules. Um, there's also no funding available for um, okay. scam okay. owners. Okay. I'll GMP. Dylan's here. <laughs> we have no, we don't. We're on the battery and we're still alive, so we can keep going. <laughs> That's what it is. So, um, yeah. especially the owners that 
maybe just happen to buy, get a dam over time, you know, they don't have funding in place to maintain them. They typically don't have a program for maintenance and they're, and they're not doing maintenance on a lot of these dams. And, you know, that doesn't apply to typically to like a hydroelectric facility where they have an income associated with that dam and that use. This would be most of those other categories where, um, you know, there just isn't a system in place for maintaining them and making repairs. So I know this is a lot of a lot up here. Um, these are some of the bigger points. And I think the, the draft bill is actually addressing quite a few of these things. Um, and, you know, just generally wanted to make the point that there are a lot of dams in the inventory that are in poor condition, including some of the ones that are a high hazard potential dam. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's not as though only the small, lower risk ones are in poor condition. Um, you know, so there is there is actually a risk here. Um, with dams, they are aging. Most of them are um, in the, you know, the average age is 80 years old. So, um, you know, you can imagine a wall left out there in the woods and no one's maintaining it. It's going to start to fall apart over time. And that's essentially what a dam is. A dam is, is a wall across the river. And, you know, there's a lot of different forces of erosion and, and weather and freeze thaw patterns that kind of eat away at it over time. So if maintenance isn't done, um, they do just really continue to degrade, creating uh, more and more of a safety issue over time. So the dam safety program that we might have had 50 years ago is not adequate now that our dams are another 50 years older. So this is, this is a problem that escalates over time, both with the deterioration due to age um, but also with climate change and larger floods that we're seeing. So, um, you know, the fact that there needs to be a bigger investment now makes sense just due to the, the type of infrastructure that this is. I mentioned what I called hazard creep. Um, the idea that um, as we have more and more development in our state, some of that development is happening downstream of a dam. Um, and then that dam... Um, Hazard classification may or may not reflect that new uh, kind of risk downstream. Um, emergency action plans, I know you have um, something in there about the committee to look at regional operation of emergency action plans. That seems like a good idea. Um, the people in charge of emergency action planning now are dam owners, which typically don't have the expertise to do that. Um, and so let's see. Rulemaking. Um, we're very excited in the engineering community about the rulemaking. We think there's a lot of great things that have been talked about as part of that. And um, I have been keeping up and participating in that rulemaking process, which has been pretty neat through phase one and um, looking forward to phase two. We've seen that. A question from Representative Bonzar is completed the slide. It's all right. Yeah. Talk to us a little, a little bit about the, the eight poor condition high hazard dams. That's alarming. Yeah. Um, and of the, some of them are overseen by the department, some by forestry, and some by a PUC. Do you know which of those? I so do the, not okay, so know the breakdown okay. of who. And then the second part of the question is if whichever regulating agency has sort of authority over those. Um, why do we have poor condition high hazard dams? Because you would think logically, going before it got to uh, poor condition, that something would have been forced on the owners. And yeah, it hasn't happened because. So I think this next sentence here: enforcement is difficult under the current dam unsafe dam proceedings. I think is a big part of it. Um, there's. It's a difficult process to make someone fix something, especially when it's very, very expensive. Um, so I, I do think that that's a big part of the problem and also that there isn't um, kind of funding available for the state to be able to come in and say, okay, well, we're gonna help you stabilize this because it's a, a public safety issue and people are at risk and so, so the loan program, I think, is is something that could help address. Dams at the point, a high risk, it's gone to the point of being in poor condition. Why would we be fixing it instead of 
from eliminating it. Why would we be fixing it instead of eliminating it? Yeah. I mean, I think eliminating it would be a great option, <laughs> in my opinion. So eliminating a dam removes all of the risk. And it, it eliminates all future maintenance, too. So, so you have a dam in place. There's always some level of risk with it. Um, even if it's in good condition, um, you know, if you remove the dam, you're going back to a natural river system, um, which is not going to fail um, sending a flood wave downstream. So I, I do agree that um, dam removal should always be part of the analysis and part of the thinking. Um, there may be situations where that is not appropriate. I mean, some of our dams in the state are flood control dams or have some very important purpose that may make sense to continue to maintain over time. So I do think that it should be part of any analysis. How do we find out about these eight dams? They are in the inventory. You don't have them in your report? I do not have them in my report, no. They're not specifically called out. We did, we sorted everything and. Like this, we've had a similar number year over year now for a while. And that's a little disconcerting. Yeah. It seems like a lot of times dams will hover in their condition for a long time because it's expensive and there's frankly no one making somebody do something to fix it. So um, the enforcement I think is Flow. We know well if the power's out and that's what's causing it the seems problem. Like the power's not out, yeah. and I've sent a message to IT to try and get some. Okay, thank you. Yep. I don't even know <laughs> it. It's kind of like, yeah. Mm -hmm. So this slide, so we published our report, the written report, and this is part of why I decided to put slides together instead of just giving you the report. Um, we published it last winter, right before um, the summer flooding. So I just felt like it's important to acknowledge that we did have quite a bit of flooding this summer. I think that's a big impetus for why you're working on the bill. And that during that flooding, a lot of the safety needs related to dams were highlighted. Um, you know, we had multiple dam failures. We had um, multiple damages related to dams um, where either dams washed out, um, causing like high velocities and erosion or causing you know, the sediment that was behind the dam to wash downstream and then smother um, people's properties or, or rivers. So um, I worked on multiple projects where you know, we saw damage to these older dams. Um, and I think that it's important that we have the resources in place to identify issues kind of prior to floods, kind of on an ongoing basis, like we were talking about, you know, target those poor condition dams and come up with a solution for them um, before failure happens. And, um, you know, I think it's also important to have the emergency repair funding in place so that when you do identify an issue or you have a flood where something needs to be stabilized, there is a system in place and funding available to do that emergency stabilization. Um, you know, this is a, a picture up here of a dam in East Calais where um, it had overtopped and washed out and, and water water's continuing to pipe through it, but there's been an emergency fix put in place um, so that it's, it's currently stable until kind of the final design and engineering and permitting can be done to do a permanent fix at this location. So, you know, that emergency funding is just an important piece here. Um, I just wanted to say that the dam program is doing an amazing job, even though they don't have enough staff. They're very spread thin. Um, they're not always able to get to their inspections at the schedule that they'd really like to. But with that, they really have prioritized safety um, and put staff into the task they need to be doing to, to get the core done. Um, we really applaud the, the efficient efforts that they, they did in July. Um, and a lot of the other kind of revamps of, of the program with inspections and inventory that have been great. And 
Our, our group actually every year honors one engineer um, who's done kind of a lifetime achievement award kind of a thing. And for the first time ever, we're actually honoring a group and we have chosen the dam safety program to receive our annual award just because they went above and beyond this year with the flooding. And, um, you know, I think just have been doing a really good job of prioritizing what they need to. So a few recommendations. Um, I have some red language here because I think that our recommendations were published in um, before the flooding and don't account for the things that are in your current bill. So we were already recommending with the current program to increase the staffing to six full-time uh, fully funded under, um, you know, non-temporary funding, like permanent funded positions. Um, and that does not include the new tasks in the bill, which looking at them would be significant, um, probably needing double that in the range of double. I don't know the exact number because I think it depends on your timeline, but you, you are going to need more people to, um, you know, implement the things that are currently in the bill. Um, we had also identified that it would be important to increase staff and training in the rivers program related to dam specific items. Um, so that doesn't include the new river corridor tasks that you've included. Um, we had already seen that there weren't enough river, river staff um, to do any kind of overlap with dams. Um, and um, we had made a note of the PUC really kind of aligning um, their work with DEC. So, you know, the idea of transferring those dams under the DEC purview would be, would meet that goal of ours. Um, and then our other goals, quite a few of them would be addressed both with um, increased staffing of the dam safety program and the phase two of the rules, um, which would address the um, updating the emergency action planning. Um, it would address the hazard creep issue with um, increased development downstream of dams um, and get to uh, kind of have the inspections happening on time. So um, I think with that, just making sure that you're both getting the staff and the financial resources to support those staff um, seems like really our only comment other than just very much supporting what you have in the bill. And then we do have a link to the full report, um, which we have loaded to your website as well. I can answer questions if you have any. Yeah, oh, thanks for your testimony. Is there anything you wish was in the this bill in the bill in its entirety or in the dam section in particular? I th I think it's good. I know, I, mean, I talked to Jared ahead of time. I think he's going to propose um, in in the wetlands section. We do a lot of restoration projects around dam removals um, and access through wetland areas has sometimes come up as an issue um, because the access might be considered separately than the project itself. So, you know, potentially also including the exemption for access to a restoration project in, in the wetland part. Um, very much support the river corridor part. We've seen so many people, <clears throat> people's properties and just affected by erosion, erosion hazards. And, you know, we just aren't consistently dealing with that on a statewide basis at this point. So I think that that's really great. Yeah. Have you seen a lot of newer, and I'll say, you know, 20 to 30 year old construction in river corridors that's been damaged or destroyed in the flooding? Yeah, we have, oh, just around the state. It's often individual homes or driveways, but yes, people are continuing to build in River corridors, and it's it's unfortunate. Thank you for your testimony. Do members have questions? <clears throat> Representative Tory, just a quick one for you with your national hat on. Um, how does the supply of civil engineers look nationally? <laughs> 
Not great. I think that goes back to our workforce challenges. Um, and, you know, one of our big overarching issues is that um, there aren't as many people going into technical fields. I think a lot of people want to be a YouTube star and they're not becoming an engineer. Um, if you can be both, right? I, I think you can be both. My favorite YouTube stars are engineers. So. <laughs> Actually, my only favorite... <laughs> Stars, so no strong no. suspicion. <laughs> They're all engineers. <laughs> um, a lot of viewers too. <laughs> yeah, I, so it's it's a good question. I think we are in river engineering. We are seeing more people wanting to get into that field, and more women. I think, which is pretty exciting. Um, you know, compared to maybe some other less exciting parts of engineering. Just to play, uh, play out a little bit, we have, you know, we have these thousand something dams, but we have more than 100, I think, the sets of My sense is that we, a whole lot of them just really don't have any reason for being there. Um, does this bill do anything? I'm still getting familiar with the bill, and maybe you're not the right person to ask this, but are we doing anything about, does this bill actually help us get to a point of just getting rid of a few hundred dams? Um, yeah, I, so there's a few, uh, what we've seen is, um, so I, I do specialize in dam removal more than repair. I've done, I do repair too, but removal is really my specialty. So um, what we're seeing is something that was really exciting out of the 2018 bill update is that the, the fees, the annual fees that got put into place have notified <laughs> landowners that first off they own a dam a lot of people didn't even realize that they did um and it's it's provided some financial incentive for them to say why am i paying this every year this dam's a problem and mosquito-y and you know my kids might fall off of it and get hurt and you know so it kind of puts the idea in someone's head that maybe there's something they could do to get out of the fee um so I think that that's one thing that I've seen. Um, I do think that it's easy to ignore a notice that says your dam's in poor condition if there's nobody following up on it. Um, so I think that that's something that could be improved. Um, I would not want to see the the emergency funding and loans go to band-aid fixes on dams that could otherwise be removed in the long run. Um, but I do think that this an emergency stabilization is important in the short term, no matter what the ultimate fate of a dam is. Um, but you know, having having that analysis of ultimately should it be fixed or ultimately should it be removed, I think could move pe people towards the removal alternative um you know rather than a very expensive repair repairs do tend to be expensive representative smith thank you these dams that are not much good for anything right now uh are they used for recreation like canoeing or boating or fishing for kids or anything like that some some are i mean there's a whole mix of uses um <laughs> we, what you know we'll see a dam and someone might say, you know, I'm 70 now. When I was a kid, I used to boat, I, mean, I used to fish and canoe, but it's all filled up with sediment now and I don't see the fish. And I know that feeling real well. Yeah, we. I hear that a lot, you know, from someone who said, I used to do this in my dam or my would home. It, would it be worth it to get rid of a dam for the sake of the recreation of it? Or keep it? Do you mean keep it for the sake of recreation? To, to keep it for this, yeah. Someone wants to pay for it. I think there's some cases where that might make sense, especially if it's maybe a state resource. In River Reservoir. Yeah. <laughs> and thousands of people in the state use it. Maybe that's one to stay. Yeah. But if it's in someone's backyard and people don't have access and it's mostly full of sediment sure. and... Sure. Still kind of... Yeah. Are we live still or no? Yes. Okay. Great. We'll watch it says I'm sharing still. 
So. Yeah, you're not, yeah. but that's okay. We're, we're finished with the slides. Do members have further questions? <coughs> no. I don't know if this is the right. Go ahead. Yeah. Representative Sevilla. Uh, well, I'm actually looking at the auditor's report and seeing the high hazards uh, that are in poor condition and a uh, few that are state-owned in my neck of the woods. And um, so that's DEC, the reports on each them. So that, I don't, do you have any recommendations for us on those? <laughs> And I think it, it, I have read the auditor's report and I, I have seen the list. Um, I have not personally worked on any of those dams or visited them in the capacity of like, so I don't have specific recommendations other than I think a lot of the things you have in the bill would move in the right direction of, of pushing landowners to um, get their dams out of poor condition. So if the landowner or if the dam owner is the state already and it's in poor condition and it's high hazard, <coughs> is the bill going to help us there? Okay. I think I think that the the funding the funding piece could. <laughs> Excuse me. The funding piece will help. Yes. Yep. Mm. Um, their attorneys here right now. The EC's attorneys here. Yeah. Good. Can we talk to them? Sorry, what was the question? And, well, there's a question about the number of state-owned high hazard poor condition dams and what the state's doing about them. Oh, I, this is Hannah Smith for the record. Um, I am afraid that that would be a question for Ben. <laughs> in terms of activities, I do know, yeah. um, as Jessica said, that they prioritize dams as they do inspections every year. Um, they do have obviously like a running list of everything that's due for inspection, um, but then the, the way that they prioritize repairs, I think, is a question that Ben would have to answer. He had a slide in his presentation yesterday that addressed this, like with um, kind of a list of current projects and dollar amounts and some photos on it. So, I mean, they are prioritizing. I, I and think. we can, DC can provide feedback on specific projects that are in the docket that have been funded. Um, we often have to then contract with the engineers that will do the work. So we have to move through the contracting process as well. But we, um, we can provide the committee with more information. That would be helpful. That would be very helpful. The representatives. Really. And so the, in the auditor's report, uh, one of these is called out as, you know, questions about whether or not um, the, the reports that are being done on the dam are going anywhere. Yeah. And so if they don't go anywhere, no one can be held liable, I think is what happens. So, yes. I, so I know there's been talk of actually filing those reports in the town record. Is my off with that? Having the inspection reports go into the town. I think we'll follow up with Ben Green. Yeah. I don't, I, this yeah. is not your area of. of um, Professional expertise, Representative Stebbins. It's not sure. Um, I remember like working on like two pieces of plywood and a cranberry bog dam, and we had to compile so many different grants to like go through the process of removing it. This is through the Massachusetts Department of Fish and Game. And then we also looked at the Neponset River, like lower mill dam, which had lots of PCB sediment in it. And it's I, it's just so much money to remove dams properly. Can I, could you give a sense of the range of like your, your experience, what you've seen? Because uh, to remove various size dams. Yeah, I mean, there's a pretty large range. And um, I think there's other people in the room that deal with that as well. What I have seen is 
it's always been less than the repair cost. <laughs> You know, when we, because we a lot of times do feasibility analyses, we'll, we'll look at a dam um, maybe for a town and they have questions about what to do. So we will look at its condition um, and estimate how much money it would cost to repair that dam, as well as the alternative of removing it. And in all cases that we've had, the removal has been less cost than to fix the dam to get it up to the current standard. So Dams come in all sizes. So, I mean, it could be, you know, $50,000 for a tiny dam or a million dollars for a big, I mean, it could be a very wide range depending on, on the conditions. So, thanks. All right, thanks for your testimony and for your patience as we were delayed. Uh, do we still need a break to get the TV started? Yeah. Okay, so we're going to take a, a technology break that will be as short as necessary to get us fully back up and running. All right, so Bill Lovett, um, we are ready to hear from you. Thank you for your patience. We are, I think, back in operation here at, at our room in the State House. Uh, welcome, Mr. Lovett. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate this opportunity to uh, testify before your committee. Uh, the previous speaker, kind of hit on some of my uh, very observations as uh, I get into my little narrative. Uh, yeah, I think you'll see where I stand. I'm honored to be asked to testify about the cooperative interaction between the state of Vermont and the city of Rutland when dealing with the Dunkley Dam situation. Had it not been for their great efforts put forth by the whole state team, I'm sure the outcome would have been much different. To set the stage, this is an old mill pond that was initially built in 1792 on the east side of Route 7 in Rutland, just to the north end of the uh, city. When the dam was constructed out of cobble and stones and put across a, a brook just to impede it, and it was that simple of a dam. The resulting pond, approximately one acre, a uh, one acre in length, was created to supply water power for a tannery built on the west side of the road and to aid in the discharge of waste chemicals into the existing brook. This is believed to be the origin of the outflowing Tanny Brook, uh, which morphed into Tenny Brook. As the community grow, uh, grew, homes were built closer and closer to the site. The chemical discharge from this tannery killed fish, caused the water to be tainted brown, and it had a, a foul odor. For this and other reasons, the tannery eventually closed. The property evolved and became a site of a lumber mill, a pencil factory. And in 19 or 1858, after the pond's uh, impediments were increased with soil and concrete berms, it became a nice pond for the uh, BF Dunkley Ice Company, which had storage sheds and became a leader in the ice industry in our area. So it was a very vibrant area at the time. Homes started encroaching on the pond. Well, the ice company and the pond changed hands quite a few times. And the last blocks of ice were harvested in 1920 after about 130 years of operation. The dam and the pond remained unmaintained as a testament to the past where neighborhood uh, children swam, fished, and played hockey. I often played hockey and fished there myself as a child. This all changed in October of 1999 when Tropical Storm Irene hit the area and the resulting deluge filled the pond with sediment, lowering the water depth, raising the pond's temperature, resulting in poor water quality, high phosphorus, murky conditions, and a fish kill. Uh, the pond essentially died. Uh, no fish, nothing. Um, any significant storm caused the pond to overtop the dam in the banks is most of the sediment filled right in behind the dam. Evacuation of the residents living close to the dam became almost routine. Every time there was a storm, we knew we were evacuating people. On June 20th, 2017, I received a call in the middle of the night from our dispatch stating that the homes at 184 and 186 North Main Street were flooding and that Dunkley Pond was overtopping the banks. As this had occurred multiple times before, since Tropical Storm Irene, I assumed that it'd be just like the other times. There was an overtopping, the residents would be evacuated, the water would eventually recede, and then our fire department would help the evacuees back into their home and try to mitigate the damage. 
I arrived on the scene to find the parking lot between the two homes filled with about two feet of water. The occupants had evacuated with their homes flooded. By the end of the event, 28 residents were asked to evacuate until this uh, situation resolved. I also observed water splashing through the guardrails on the bridge on North Main Street, which is US 7, the major north-south thoroughfare through the city. A tree had been torn from the banking um, and had jammed under the bridge, causing the water to be forced up over the, the uh, roadway. If this bridge had actually failed, it would have severed the north-south artery through the city and resulted in a wave that would have likely taken out six to seven downstream bridges. Sewer and water mains would have been lost. As the storm passed, the water receded and we saw great evidence of the damage to the earthen berms, the cement walls, the dam spillway in its face. Water was undermining the berm and was shooting through the face of this dam. To augment the earthen berms and divert water from flowing through the houses, the city of Rutland brought in truckloads of asphalt grinding. Ironically, we had been doing a road press, uh, project and we had some scrap material at the time. We called Vermont Emergency Management and advised them and the owner of the dam, the, the Shaw family was notified. On June 20th, um, 2017, Ben Green, dam safety engineer, Josh uh, Carvalho from the river management and Todd Manise from river management met with the city. The water by then had gone down. Now the dam face showed the signs of the uh, flooding. On the east side, it had failed. There was a significant lean to this dam. Water was flowing through the face of the dam and the water was leaking to a point where it had lowered itself below the spillway. It was estimated that this pond was containing less than 500,000 cubic feet of water. The recommendation was to take the dam down in a controlled manner. On June 21st, 2017, the dam was judged to pose a significant hazard, meaning that the failure um, is expected to cause loss of life and appreciable damage to roads, homes, and other downstream infrastructure. As the city's EMD, I created an evacuation plan to deal with the probable failure of the dam. 93 properties would have been affected, with 21 deemed to be imminent uh, immediate significant danger to life and 24 with severe damage to their property. The state contacted the property owners. There was a discussion and the state decided it would take the lead due to the uh, quick resolution of this uh, dangerous situation. The city uh, agreed to do daily monitoring of the site and do anything else we could to assist the state. As we lacked, uh, lacked the expertise in this sort of emergency to resolve this issue, the state's participation was critical. They really saved us here. As more players came on board, the scope of this Herculean task became quite obvious. The amount of details were enormous and the state's commitment to see this project through was and is to this day still unshaken. We met and made many new friends, friends through this process. Foremost, Todd Manise from the River Management Engineer. He promised he'd see this project through and he has. He's led us through regulatory requirements as well as relationships that we would need to build to resolve this issue uh, between the state, the city and the neighbors. Uh, he introduced me to many skilled professionals um, and they're on the state and we should be proud of this. Uh, Karina Daly from Vermont Natural Resource Council, Zapata Courage, from District Wetland Ecology, Steve Libby from the Vermont River Conservancy, Julie Butler from Lake Champlain Fish and Wildlife, Polly Allen, who ultimately created a historical analysis of our site, Elizabeth uh, Peeble from Vermont Division of Historic Preservation, uh, Angela Rapella from the U.S. Corps of Army Engineers, the list goes on and on, and to be honest with you, it's amazing. I really don't don't intend to forget anybody because their efforts were certainly uh, very much appreciated. In 2019, the Vermont Ecosystems Restoration Program um, granted the Vermont River Conservancy uh, funding to design a full removal. Plan was created by uh, 
uh, contractor in Malone and McBroom to restore the floodplain, to restore the wetland and the aquatic organisms, and to remediate the Tinney Brook and improve the wildlife habitat. The primary components of this project were to remove the accumulated accumulation of sediment, site grading for natural stream flora, removing the remains of the dam itself, and the restoration of uh, representative plant community, and to restore the aquatic habitat. Public meetings were held. We consulted the neighbors so that they were part of this plan. Sediment storage was um, quite a challenge, but uh, ended up the city of Rutland uh, took the sediment and uh, has utilized that in other areas. Um, on the morning of October 30th, 2019, the first stone was removed from the top of the dam. The intention was to lower the, the dam height, thus lowering the water behind the dam until a final solution could be made. First stone was removed from the top of the dam. When the second remove, uh, the second stone was removed, the resulting dam collapsed. Because of their knowledge and their plans, the plans of lowering the water down to re, you know to limit the amount of sediment released and the skill of the operator of the uh, equipment, the disaster was avoided. Something that certainly we would never have had any idea could have happened. The site was secured for the winter, made safe. This was the first time in many years the neighbors had not experienced any flooding in the spring. The entire downstream area saw no spring flooding that year. On April 15th, 2020, vegetation began to start reclaiming the site. Native animal life was rediscovering this uh, land that it hadn't seen in a long time. May 20th, 2022, a buffer planting was started and finished four day, or six days later. So some, uh, since September 26, 2023, historic markers are in place to educate the public on the history of this site. Its value to the earliest indigenous people of over 13,000 years ago throughout and up until this recent history. Today, the restored floodplain is native to plants, native animals such as deer, fox, squirrel, bobcats, beavers, and birds, wildlife, including ducks, herrings, and birds of prey often feed in the cool, clean waters. Fish have migrated back into the site, navigating a fish ladder that was installed down by the falls. The sitting benches are utilized by the neighbors in traveling public to view this area as a rec recreational retreat. The historic markers also have had a considerable amount of uh, work from the school children in the area. This has been a win for both the city and the state and the cooperative efforts between each. The removal of the dam has eliminated dangers posed by this dam failure and the infrastructure that would have been damaged had it failed. The benefit to the site to absorb the impact of sudden water events and then to gradually release it back into the stream basin is less than the spring runoff that we dealt with for the past 30, 40 years. I would invite you to you know, visit this site someday firsthand so you can see how important it is to the people of Rollin and our community. Um, anyone have any questions? That, that was such a great uh, story of the dam removal. Thank you so much for sharing it. <clears throat> I, I pulled it up on, on Google Maps and looked at the terrain and I encourage others to do that while you were talking because the, the underlying kind of USGS still shows the ponds and the and yes. then there's the Google, the aerial photo, which shows the restored site that you were describing. And it's a perfect model for another bill that we've been talking about and main, trying to maintain wildlife and travel corridors through even our most developed towns. And you just gave us great um, testimony on how that works and how important it can be for the community. Well, it, it certainly brought the community together. I mean, the the way the state and to a certain extent the city handled it where the community and the abutters had opportunities to have the input to decide what was in their best interest um it was incredible i'm still getting photographs from some of the neighbors as new wildlife find the area out uh, um it, it is certainly healed it, it 
certainly when we have a rain event, I used to be able to count about a 30 minute window before I would start having flood reports and haven't had one since. So uh, it's certainly a success. Thank you. That's great. Um, we love ending our day with such an upbeat story. Do members have questions? Thank you again for your testimony. Anytime. My pleasure. Our next tip, we have Jared Carpenter. Good afternoon, everyone. I was thinking this is the first time I've been sitting in this chair this year. Um, so, Madam Chair, members of the committee, um, good to see you all in the setting. My name is Jared Carpenter with Lake Champlain Committee. Um, so initially, I was going to testify on the dam safety section and some of those some of those aspects of the bill. My testimony for that is posted on the website if folks want to read it. But as you've had a fair amount of testimony on dam safety and the sections of things of that nature, um, the advocates, um, uh, Conservation Law Foundation, Lake Champlain Committee, um, Nature Conservancy, and Vermont Natural Resources Council do have some suggested changes for the bill. Little, little tweaks that we wanted to walk you through. I don't have, I don't have any slides. That is also on the website. The um, um, it's a it's a front and a back. It's a two page memo to the committee uh, with page numbers and sections and the suggested changes in red. Um, and we were just going to sort of I was just going to sort of walk through. And if you had specific questions that I cannot answer, the folks who have testified, um, Lauren Karina and Jess and Hannah. Um, are available. Well, I can't vouch for him. Um, they are available to uh, help out and answer any questions. So um, I don't know, Madam Chair, if you want to. I don't have sharing abilities. I don't know if, if you can post it, maybe just to put it over my head, if that's all right, Madam um, Chair. Or... We all have it, right? Okay. <laughs> On our devices. Um, and I'll also be referencing the bill itself, um, just so you can see the context. I only put in like a lot, you know, put in sentences in, in little sections. So to see the context, you will need a copy of the bill. Um, so, you know, just as a little a little background and context, all of our organizations have been working on this bill in its various forms um, for quite a while. And then, of course, down in the Senate, um, the river the river corridors and the wetlands bills were actually ones that you had last year that were combined into this with a few changes. Uh, the dam safety section is um, is new. It's cut out of whole cloth, and we um, we started in maybe October, November, uh, going back and forth with ANR on the various sections of the dam safety provisions, and it landed where we have. Um, obviously, a lot of collaboration um, and some disagreements, and sometimes we didn't land on on collaboration. But the point was to bring in something that um, a, a product for the most part that we would all we um, ourselves, the advocates, the agencies, others would all agree on that would accomplish the goals of uh, flood resilience and, you know, flood resilience and mitigation um, in terms of the dam safety section, of course, um, providing um, the dam safety program with some more tools and equipment, not only in enforcement, but also in safety, but also some provisions that would encourage removal. And we're, so we're sort of hoping that this will encourage, um, obviously, not only um, helping the dam safety program achieve its goals, but also encourage people who have a backyard dam that might not be serving much of a purpose, as we've talked about in all these conversations, that would spurn, spurn removal. Um, the safest dam is one that's not there. Um, and that's sort of the mantra we've been, we've been pursuing um, during these conversations that, yes, a lot of dams do serve a purpose and should be repaired, especially if they provide a public benefit. But there's a lot out there that they're in somebody's backyard, they don't provide a public benefit, and they don't do much, and really removal should be considered. And that language and that impetus has been incorporated in provisions in the dam safety fund itself. So um, I will start, you know, the, the first change is pretty straightforward. Um, it's in the river corridors section on page three, um, section 3A. Um, this is something I believe was initially incorporated in the bill, but for some reason was removed. Um, Rob Evans also talked about it as well. It's simply when, when DEC um, starts working on the procedure for river quarters based mapping, that they work in consultation with the ACCD and the regional planning commissions. Um, it just makes sense to have their expertise on board as well. Um, 
in, in terms of consultation rather than just having DEC go it alone. Um, I don't know if I've characterized that accurately. It's a pretty, pretty straightforward um, provision. Yeah, do you know if the language was specifically removed for a purpose or does anyone know that? In the I think that what happened in the drafting process before the Senate is there was reference to collaboration with ACCB in, in language that was removed. And I do believe it was intended to be reincorporated into this requirement. And it just, there were two different references to our mapping updates. One of them had the collaboration, one didn't. It accidentally got removed. I think it got lost in the show. Yeah. Okay. I, I don't think it was intentional. And the, my understanding from program staff is that they are working in collaboration with other agencies. Great, thanks. The the second suggestion is uh, we're up now on up to uh, page 25. We're back, back in the wetlands section. Um, um, Jess alluded to this um, in her testimony, um, Madam Chair, after you asked about, you know, suggestions that, 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 could, that could be added. Um, so this is, um, you know, obviously in, in trying to, in the efforts of doing dam removal and restoration projects, and I'm certainly no expert on this, um, but sometimes wetlands are disturbed, um, but this would, would provide that temporary access for dam removals is an allowed use within wetland under this rule. In the wetland rule, there's a number of allowed uses, um, and this would, this would allow um, these projects to go forward without having to get a wetland permit today, Just making sure I characterize things accurately. Regardless of their size or impact? I can defer to Karina on this or, or the status of the well. Yeah, this is Karina Daly for the record. Um, so this is for, to be clear, this is for restoration projects. So floodplain restoration, dam removal, and wetlands restoration. So no permit. So these already fall under an allowed use in the Vermont wetlands rules, but the temporary access is a hang up, which Jessica spoke to earlier in remove, sometimes removing those dams and permit has been required for that access. Um, and we're asking for that temporary access to also be part of the allowed use. Okay. Um, but they would be, re they would be restored. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Temporary oh. access. There would be no, there would be no, well, I can't say that. But the, the, the access would be restored. Any access would be restored. And obviously we would avoid and minimize mitigate first and work with the wetlands program as we concurrently do to make sure we're meeting those allowed use standards. This is an odd paragraph. Cause it's, it's not, well, it's like, it's talking about um, comp wetlands mitigation or adverse impacts to more than 5,000 square feet of wetlands. It doesn't, I'm gonna have to look at it in context to see if it is what you're thinking it is because it's a, a seemingly a non sequitur when I read this paragraph. I see that. I see that too. Okay. All right. We will. We can look at that. We hear your point. I don't know if this is the paragraph it belongs in, but we'll figure that out. And we can, and we'll go back and look at it again. Sure. For sure. Um, and the next. Uh, one, two, three, which is our last one, two, three. One is in the, um, one is in the, uh, the, the jurisdiction, um, the transfer of jurisdictions from dams from the PUC to DEC. Um, that section itself starts on page 33. I mean, you've heard plenty of testimony that, um, you know, the dam safety program has the expertise where the PUC does not necessarily have it. And therefore moving the dams over um, would make sense just to consolidate it in the, ex in the area of expertise. There has been some concerns with folks on the timeline uh, with this. There are four high hazard dams um, that are listed actually in my other testimony. Um, it's concerns of some that, that, that 2028 is an awfully long time scale for high hazard dams to still be under the PUC jurisdiction. So it is our, is our suggestion that the four high hazard dams be moved um, by 2025 and the remaining dams still stay on the 2028 schedule. Um, there are some concerns with in, within the dam safety program that this time frame is um, is too fast. Um, we are hopeful with the extra staffers um, that have been requested, um, which we which we certainly support. That this timeline would be um, 
achievable for these four dams. Um, Do we know the condition of those four dams? Um, I can get back to you on that. I have the information, it's just buried in my laptop. And I also feel like the testimony we just heard indicated from, from GMP that PUC had higher standards currently than DEC uh, in terms of work. Work in PUC were higher than no, DEC. I heard the testimony as well, and I can't speak to it because my understanding was that with DEC, with, all, with their own engineers, that they had, that they had higher standards than the PUC did, but I might be completely mistaken because I'm not an expert in this area. Um, but everyone has agreed that um, they don't have you know they don't have engineers, so they don't have people who can actually go out and do the inspections and do the dam safety. So I'm not sure how that reflects upon their safety standards without having the people to actually inspect and enforce those safety standards. Mm -hmm. Jessica, did you have a thought on this or a? a experience to work on those stamps. One of the things that came up in the infrastructure report card was that the PHC has a, um, doesn't have the inspections happen as often. Um, so the PUC has the high hazard dams inspected only every five years, um, whereas the DEC requires annual inspections for those high hazard dams. So that was every two years. Point that every two years for two years. So, oh yeah, we said annually or every other year. So, but if the standards are lower, all right. Well, there you go. This question. He was specifically saying the standards for reevaluation during like a comprehensive. He wasn't speaking to all standards. He was specific about what he said in his testimony earlier. Anna Smith, did you have a, something sure. to add? I think that one, the, the two agencies employ similar standards in terms of what's been adopted into rule, and both agencies also look to the Army Corps guidance for the most up-to-date technical standards. The PUC does have a rule that's been in place, and DEC is still working on adoption of a rule that would implement our technical standards. Um, I, I, I think that it's fair to say the PUC is it's perfectly capable of regulating those dams in the way that it has been. The agents, a &R does not disagree that consolidation under a single agency is a, a good idea, but a &R advocates strongly that we need the time to understand how we would manage these dams. Um, several of them are owned by GMP. They're obviously all hydro dams now because they're under the jurisdiction of PUC. So, they're much more complex from a regulatory standpoint, and GMP is also a responsible dam owner. So those things do factor into it, the agency's advocacy that the timeline for transfer happened in 2028. The other important piece of our timeline is that our highest priority right now, in addition to the ongoing management of dams, is getting our technical standards adopted. And we have, that rule keeps getting pushed to the back burner as we've dealt with flooding. And so we would really, um, the limited staff that we have need time to get our own rules adopted and not begin to implement those because we need to be on another docket. Thank you. I think it would be helpful to know the condition of those stands. I just, um, during the discussion, I was able to pull them up, Madam Chair. Um, so the four dams are, um, the four high hazard dams under PUC are Chittenden Reservoir, owned by GMP in the town of Chittenden, uh, Marshfield Pond, also owned by GMP, GMP Cabot, Wolcott, um, down of Wolcott, and Middlesex owned by GMP also in Middlesex. Um, checking, cross-checking it with another list, um, Chittenden, Marshfield, and Middlesex are all in good condition. Wolcott isn't fair. Chittenden, Marshfield, Cabot are in good? Chittenden, Marshfield, and Middlesex are all in good condition, and then Wolcott isn't fair. And I can type up some. So you have. Who owns the Wolcott one? H E. I don't know who that is. Okay. 
What are your other suggested changes? So the other two suggested changes are in the, um, uh, I'll take you to the unsafe dam um, revolving loan fund or the dam safety revolving loan fund. It's on page 44. Um, this, if you recall, is changes as one as was the unsafe dam revolving loan fund. Now is the dam safety revolving loan fund. Um, it has been funded in the house budget to uh, the tune of a million dollars. Um, the million dollars was in the governor's request um, budget proposal. That request was changed a little bit in the initial draft of this bill to two million dollars when it left uh, Senate Natural, and then of course the money was taken out in Senate appropriations. But there is a million dollars for the fund, and it, it um, it's divided into two two parts: the emergency funding and the non-emergency funding. Um, the emergency funding is just is just that. It's on uh, page forty five. Um, and to provide emergency funding for critical time sensitive temporary safety or risk risk reduction measures, um, such as red floor drawdown, partial or fully breaching, stabilization, et cetera. And that's meet the following criteria. The dam must be under the regulatory jurisdiction of DEC, dam safety program, and B, the dam must be in need of critical time sensitive safety or risk reduction measures in order to protect public safety and property. We have absolutely no no problems with this with the emergency funding provision. That makes sense. The DEC should have full flexibility to use this million dollars in an emergency or portions of it in emerg in an emergency situation. Um, it is uh, largely loan money, although there are circumstances where it can be what is called a, uh, I believe, a subsidized loan, which I think is another was another way of saying a grant in my in my mind. Um, where we have some concerns is not in the emergency funding, but is in the non-emergency funding. Um, as was discussed before, um, it is, we think an alternatives analysis should always be done and it's at languages in here to see if dam removal is the best option um, before in a non-emergency situation, you have enough time to do an analysis and, th and to think about this. And the best way to reduce the risk and often as just alluded to often in a more in inexpensive way is to remove the dam rather than to repair the dam, which leads to other problems of, are they gonna maintain the dam? Is there enough funding to maintain the dam? Is, are they gonna you know, keep up with the maintenance? All, all these other factors. And is there a public benefit to repairing this dam or are you loaning state or granting state money to a private owner for their own benefit to repair their pond? Um, excuse me, to repair their dam for their for their fish pond. So with that in mind, there are much more criteria that need to be met in the non-emergency funding, which is down on the bottom of page 45. Again, it must be under regulatory jurisdiction of PEC. That would be classified as a significant hazard. Um, dam owner must provide an operation and maintenance plan, um, as well as provide financial information to so, show sufficient resources. Um, Proof that all uh, local, state, and federal permits have been obtained, um, and then if you look at what our suggestions are, E and F, um, not to be eligible for non-emergency funding, an alternatives analysis of dam repair, rehabilitation, and removal options that considers an evaluation of risk reduction, dam safety, and ecological resilience, and public benefit considerations, and costs be completed pursuant to a rule adopted by the department. And then the red text is our suggestion. Loan subsidy is not available for non-emergency rare repair or rehabilitation, only for engineering analysis and design and dam removal. So rather than loaning money for a non-emergency dam repair, dam repair or that can then be subsidized, um, excuse me, that only a loan, only a loan subsidy would be available for grant removal, um, not for not for repair. That's what I'm trying to spit out. And then the second part is um, similar to this, only engineering analysis, design and construction um, by DC, DFW or third party contractors that results in dam removal are eligible for loan subsidy. So they're sort of, they sort of work together. So that is our thought of we need, need to drive, um, I think dam removals really wherever we can um, and not loan money out for dam repairs for a, in a non-emergency situation. And those are our suggestions. Members have questions? I was thinking about that last sentence. Yeah. 
All right. Who, Thanks. Uh, yeah, no, actually, yeah. um, who would be opposed to um, not um, allowing dam repairs? Who would be opposed to not allowing? <laughs> to your recommendation that it only be for dam removal. Um, well, we went back and forth with the DEC for a while. Um, they wanted more for more flexibility, but I don't. The agency anything. is opposed. The agency would like the flexibility to subsidize loans that allow for the greatest risk reduction, even when that doesn't result in removal. The greatest risk reduction often is going to be removal, but the program is asking for flexibility in how they administer the funding. And so what what is the risk of allowing flexibility? We would prefer that if that money, the, as I said before, we think the goal should be removal as it's the safest option. So if money is going to be granted to somebody for that, it should be for removal and not for repairs. If somebody's, you know, if somebody's receiving private benefit for the use of the dam, they should have to pay for the pay for the repairs, not the state funding, especially considering it's so limited at the moment. These are just the private dams. Well, it'd be applicable to all dams. Most dams, a lot of dams are privately owned. I mean, GMP maintains their own dams. Most of the problems that we have were prepared with, with poor conditioned dams are privately owned and sometimes municipal dams um, that become a threat to people and, and uh, property downstream. So we would advocate those would be removed and not repaired. But what's the risk of allowing flexibility? I don't suppose there is a risk, but to us, this would be another impetus towards, towards removal, um, which should be the driving factor. Although the other way of looking at that may be that you're going to incent people to let their dams become an emergency. Where is that? And uh, yeah. If I may. Karina Daly, for the record, I think the risk is the ecological, losing the, eco, the ecological benefit of removing the dam. So there's a risk to the wildlife, to the water quality, to future flood control or flood reduction. Um, if the dam were to stay and the funds were, uh, were, were being provided. I also have a concern that, and now the hope is that it's a million dollars right now and it's probably not going to go any higher in the FY25 budget. And that the state makes great use of this and they come back to the legislature next year and say, look, well, we use this million dollars. Do we have five or what have you, whatever number? And then they become more, there's more money and there's more to fill more needs. Um, I mean, I think with a million dollars, it's pretty much going to be the most immediate need, as you were referencing before, and not somebody's little pond. But at the same time, I mean, yes, it is our preference to push towards dam removal rather than rather than subsidized repair. And it's specifically the loan subsidy. You could still get a loan for the repair. You could get a loan for it. I don't I have no idea. Usually, when, when DEC loans out money, it's for it's either no interest or exceptionally low risk, low interest if like the SRF is any, it's any indication, it's usually one or 2% loan, but it's a loan. And so it's perpetually refilling the, the million dollars that's coming back in. If you're $200,000 $200, in a grant going out the door, suddenly your loan fund is $800,000. And I don't know how much $800,000 gets you in a dam repair, but probably one. Representative Simmons. Well, I, I from, for me, it's, um, and sorry, this isn't so much a question, but it's more, we have limited dollars. And um, to me, not that dam repair is always, uh, to me, it's like with limited dollars, how can we make those dollars go the farthest? And we just heard testimony that says, it's always cheaper to remove than repair. And if the dam has gotten to a state that is, it is needing this emergency support, I don't know why we would take limited state dollars to kind of put a Band-Aid on it or to, to loan the dollars for a Band-Aid fix um, instead of actually addressing the core route. You know, if, if a private, home, private dam owner wants to do that with their own dollars, then they could do that. But these are the state dollars. And that's it's sort of the good money after a bad investment piece that, that I'm struggling with. I guess I'm really concerned about the municipal aspect of it. Okay. Can you flesh that out a little? Well, and uh, just, you know, 
where these dams might be located. I don't have enough information. I, I'm thinking about the dam that I was talking about in the last segment, which is owned by the state. But if it was owned by the town, that's quite a feat to remove that dam uh, in a heavily populated area, um, just the way everything is structured. I have to imagine that would be really, really expensive. And just a point of clarification on what you said, Representative Simmons, this is non-emergency, not emergency. So I, I think I'm non-emergency. I need, yes. So, okay. Yeah, the emergency funding is obviously yeah. as much flexibility as these with the EC needs. It's the non-emergency. Right now they're just called out. Um, and there's always people out there um, who are willing to help with dam removals. And dam removals are often free or, or very low cost to the owners because there's all sorts of grant money available and folks that are always looking for dams to remove. <laughs> I could just add to that, Karina Daly, Restoration Jobs. There, there is grant money for dam removal. I wouldn't say there's all sorts of it. There are no, okay. many more dams out there than there is funding for, and it takes so many years to get the funding for some dams that are about to fall apart on their own and severely damage downstream communities. But in, and, but in terms of the downtown, a friends of, I sit on the board of Friends of the Winooski River, and is it Michelle who's doing the Northfield Dam, or are you doing the Northfield Dam? Michelle. So uh, Cross Brothers? Yeah. I'm doing. And that's right in the middle of Northfield. Yes. So it's, it doesn't have to be sort of out in, in the middle of nowhere. They can, they can do them downtown. I, I'd have to imagine it's a little more technically difficult, but certainly possible to do dam removals. You just heard a downtown story, or close to. True. Um, all right. This was great. Thank you for your suggestions. Um, Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you all, committee, for the time and the consideration. Adjourned for the day. Back on after the floor tomorrow morning, right after the floor.